Welcome back to the Fae of Ice and Fire series, where we explore real-world Fae lore to see how it might unlock magical mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire. This next installment will look at the Iron Islands. We get a surprising amount of insight through the points of view of Theon, Asha, Victarion, and Aaron Greyjoy. The Ironborn are a remarkable people, surviving in an inhospitable land for millennia. Their culture promotes combat and conquest, however, they are prohibited from raiding within their own islands. For much of their history, the Ironborn elected leaders through a king's moot. Every captain who owned a ship could put himself forward as a candidate for king, and the ultimate decision bound all participants. In A Feast for Crows, Aaron Greyjoy calls a king's moot after King Balon dies. It's a desperate move, as there hasn't been a king's moot in centuries, but Aaron is determined not to allow his brother Euron to become king. Aaron calls for all the Ironborn captains to assemble on Old Wick, at a place called Naga's Hill. We get our first point of view description when Victarion arrives. Ahead loomed the sacred shore of Old Wick and the grassy hill above it, where the ribs of Naga rose from the earth like the trunks of great white trees, as wide around as a drummond's mast and twice as tall. The bones of the Grey King's Hall. Victarion could feel the magic of this place. We get a similar description from Aaron's point of view, along with more of the history and lore of the site. On the crown of the hill, four and forty monstrous stone ribs rose from the earth like the trunks of great pale trees. Naga had been the first sea dragon, the mightiest ever to rise from the waves. She fed on krakens and leviathans and drowned whole islands in her wrath. Yet the Grey King had slain her, and the drowned god had changed her bones to stone. Naga's ribs became the beams and pillars of his long haul, just as her jaws became his throne. According to legend, the Grey King ruled the Iron Islands during the Age of Heroes. He was a Garth Greenhand-like figure who supposedly married a mermaid and lived for a thousand years. The World of Ice and Fire tells us, It was the Grey King who brought fire to the earth by taunting the Storm God until he lashed down with a thunderbolt, setting a tree ablaze. The Grey King also taught men to weave nets and sails and carved the first longship from the hard, pale wood of Yig, a demon tree who fed on human flesh. Many people have theorized that Naga's ribs are in fact petrified weirwood. They are compared to trees multiple times and are described as white stone. We can't be sure about sea dragons, but we know that Valyrian dragon bones are black from their high iron content. There are also examples of wood and Naga's bones being used to describe the same materials. The Grey King's crown was said to be made of either Naga's teeth or driftwood. The ironborn priest Galen Whitestaff was named for the staff he carried, and in some tales it was made of weirwood, but in others it was made from Naga's bones. Notably, it was Galen Whitestaff who forbade the ironborn from raiding within the Iron Islands. He also called the first king's moot, summoning the Ironborn captains to Old Wick to choose a king for the first time. In World, the maesters have questioned the origins of the bones, arguing that the ribs aren't large enough to have belonged to a dragon capable of feasting on leviathans and giant krakens, noting that there are no records of sea dragons existing at all. Our next logical question is, if the bones are actually weirwood, how did it get to the top of Naga's Hill? We are specifically told that the Iron Islands were never well forested and the soil is too thin to support the growth of weirwoods. If that's the case, we have to assume it was brought from the mainland of Westeros. But how? Or why? We have another example of an ironborn king using weirwood in construction. King Heron the Black built Heron Hall with weirwood for the rafters and beams. But I don't think that Naga's ribs held up a long haul. Earlier, we noted that the Grey King, according to legend, carved the first longship from the hard pale wood of Yig, a demon tree who fed on human flesh. I don't know about you, but for myself, I can't imagine that Yig was anything other than a weirwood tree. But why would a longship be at the top of the hill? And what does any of this have to do with the Fae? Fear not, dear viewer, we have an answer. All of the earlier parts of this series have examined real-world burial mounds to draw parallels to magical sites within A Song of Ice and Fire. I found something interesting while reading about the various archaeological sites in the UK and Ireland. There is a 6th or 7th century Anglo-Saxon burial site in England called Sutton Hoo. It caught my attention because it includes one of the few ship burials in England. 
meaning that a ship was used to construct the gravesite. To quote Wikipedia, The heavy oak vessel had been hauled from the river up the hill and lowered into a prepared trench, so only the tops of the stem and stern posts rose above the land surface. After the addition of the body and the artifacts, an oval mound was constructed which covered the ship and rose above the horizon at the riverward side of the cemetery. This appears to have been the final occasion upon which the Sutton Hoo Cemetery was used for its original purpose. Long afterwards, the roof collapsed violently under the weight of the mound, compressing the ship's contents into a seam of earth. There isn't a photo available of the original longship used at the burial site because the wood has long since rotted away, but there is currently an effort to create an accurate replica based on the soil records, and we can see here that the ship would have been placed hull down in the trench with the ribs pointed upwards toward the sky. The fact that the wood at the Sutton Hoo burial site rotted away supports our theory. We are told in A Dance with Dragons, when Jamie visits Raven Tree Hall, that weirwood does not rot. It petrifies. So, hypothetically, if someone were to build a longship with weirwood and use that to construct a ship burial, like the one at Sutton Hoo, after thousands of years and the collapse of the mound's roof, the remaining structure would be large white stone ribs protruding from the earth, exactly how Naga's ribs are described. This is no mine. It's a tomb. At this point, we have a very strong case. Before we move on to the last pieces of evidence, let's quickly recap what we've put together. Naga's ribs are a holy site to the ironborn. They sit atop a hill with the ribs protruding from the earth. They are described like trees. They are white and have a stony texture like petrified weirwood. The ironborn believe the ribs belonged to a sea dragon, but some maesters have stated that the ribs aren't large enough to have belonged to the creature described in legend. There are multiple instances of weirwood and naga's bones being used to describe the same materials. The site was said to have been constructed by the Grey King, who cut down an ancient weirwood to build the first longship. And we know that in the real world, there are Anglo-Saxon longship burial mounds that match the description of Naga's bones. We have a solid case for theorizing that Naga's ribs are a weirwood burial mound, like the mounds under Winterfell, the Wall, and the House of the Undying. But what about the size? Martin has previously stated that he has drawn inspiration from real-world historical sites when writing A Song of Ice and Fire. The Wall is reminiscent of Hadrian's Wall, the Rock of Gibraltar is reimagined as Casterly Rock. It's entirely possible, perhaps likely, that Martin visited Sutton Hoo during his travels in England and was inspired to write about the Grey King and Naga's bones. Many historians believe that the large ship burial at Sutton Hoo is the final resting place of the Anglo-Saxon King Radwald, and much like the Wall and Casterly Rock, Martin's larger-than-life imagination would explain the enormity of Naga's ribs compared to ordinary trees and longships. But this is the Fae of Ice and Fire series, and we've barely touched on the magical implications. As we covered earlier, weirwoods cannot grow on the Iron Islands, because much like the Erie, the soil is too thin. The conditions are overall inhospitable. We could assume that any first men living there would lose any past connection to the children of the forest and the weirwoods on the main continent, but we have also established that weirwoods don't rot from age or being cut. In fact, it appears that fire is the only sure way to kill them. From that perspective, the King's Moot takes on a whole new meaning as a site of sacrifice to the old gods. In Feast, Roderick the Reader tells Asha that When last the Salt Kings and the Rock Kings met in King's Moot, Euron of Orkmont let his axemen loose among them, and Naga's ribs turned red with gore. House Grey Iron ruled unchosen for a thousand years from that day, until the Andals came. In addition to the red and white weirwood imagery we get from this description, it could also indicate that the king's moot doubled as a sacrificial ceremony. Bloodshed aside, the process requires each candidate to bring offerings and valuables. We also see Euron Greyjoy sacrifice one of his sons at the king's moot of 300 AC when he asks for the dragonbinder horn to be blown. All of this adds up, if the Ironborn are actually first men, but culturally, they seem to be very different, and the maesters in A World of Ice and Fire agree. The Ironborn worship the Drowned God. The First Men worship the Old Gods. The maesters use this difference in religious belief as the basis for their idea that the Ironborn are not in fact First Men. If the Ironborn were to have worshipped the Old Gods at some point, perhaps they were First Men. 
So how are these two ideologies reconciled? I believe that the answer lies with Galen Whitestaff. He seems to be at the crux of all of the stories, of Naga's bones being part of a sea dragon, the king's moot itself, the story of the sea dragon's bones being turned into stone. It's possible that as a political move, this priest or green seer constructed a narrative to culturally differentiate the ironborn from the first men of continental Westeros while still maintaining sacrifice to the old gods. If the ironborn have gone centuries without engaging in a king's moot or visiting Naga's bones, it's possible that they are in great danger and perhaps Euron's arrival is a blessing, although I don't believe so. To the contrary, I believe Euron knew what he was doing in forcing Aaron's hand and having the king's moot called. Euron craves power, the old gods have power, and now Euron, much like Craster and perhaps Oberyn, has sacrificed his son to obtain that power, not from the horn like some of us initially imagined, but from the old gods. With one question answered, we are left with more than when we started. What is the connection between the weirwoods and the water? What are the implications for other rootless weirwood constructions? These questions and more will be answered as we delve further into the Fae of Ice and Fire, so be sure to hit the subscribe button if you don't want to miss the next part. I am also very close to having 1,000 subscribers. Thank you to everyone who has already subscribed. Once the Mirror Reads channel does hit 1,000 subscribers, there will be a special live stream where we go over one of the preview chapters from Winds of Winter. If you want to help select the preview chapter or vote on which theory is covered next in the series, consider subscribing to my Patreon. My theories will never be hidden behind a paywall, but I am hoping that with your help, I can put out higher quality videos on a more regular basis. Until next time!